Yeah. Run it up, then run it back. Yeah. Run it up, then run it back. Run it back. Run it up, yeah. run it back. Yeah. Run it up, then run it back. Yeah, yeah. Happy Monday and good morning. This looks like a very official news program in the morning. This is Run It Back on Federal <clears throat> TV. My name is Michelle Beadle. That is Chandler Parsons, who's just gotten back from the Kentucky Derby. And I mean, what a riot. <laughs> I had never been, and it was a lot of fun. It was a great experience. Uh -huh. Randall, thank you for having me. But my God, you think mm -hmm. you've people watched before? You go to this place, it is it is something. It's, it's hot. Something. It's sticky. It rains every time. It's humid. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sweating right now. It's 66 degrees in here. <laughs> it was brutal, but yep. it was a lot of fun. It's definitely a thing that if you're a sports person, just go do it once. I learned about a trifecta box. So you can do, you can bet in Kentucky for the trifecta box. If you pick five horses, and they have to five, like three of the five have to finish in the top three. Right. And I did it. Oh, what does that pay? Huge. Nice. Yeah. Rich get richer. Yeah, We've got not... a couple really important <laughs> guests today uh, joining us on the show. Oh! Hey, we got two guests. Oh, two guests. Blue right. Will and Sean Sharonia. Well, well, well. Shab's got something next Thursday, so we call it out this week. <laughs> so shout out to Shab's. Um, guys, we do have, we finally have the end to the series that no one watched that we can finally talk about. Magic Cavs. It went seven, by the way. How about that being the only thing that goes It took seven. him seven games to get an opening of a show, but you know what? <laughs> so here We're we are. Here. Uh, yep, Donovan Mitchell. He's good. 106-94. Uh, no Jared Allen. It's the largest comeback in a game seven since 97-98. They happened to be down 18 in that second quarter. Uh, Mitchell finished with 39. He was 15 of 17 from the free throw line. Evan Mobley had 11. Uh, Paolo Bencaro, he tried. 38-16. Mm -hmm. Franz Wagner with six mm. points, one of 15. That's gonna be one of those moments where he doesn't ever forget, like, what happened to you? But Chandler, um, Mitchell said afterwards he was, quote, tired of losing in the first round. We've already started the speculation. Now he's gotten past the first round. Does this do anything to quiet that? I don't think so, honestly. I think <laughs> this is a series that, again, you, you said no one really watched it, and it was a very competitive one. Seven games, all home teams won every single game, yeah. which shows the signs of a young series. Both teams couldn't go <laughs> on the road and, and managed to get a win. But I think this is just a Band-Aid on their problems. I think everyone knows about the, the disconnect between the players and J.B. Bickerstaff, which I still don't fully get because mm. I never had him as a head coach, but as an assistant coach, he was one of my favorites I've ever played for. So I think this just kind of masked the problem Problems, and now I think they're really going to get exposed and frustrated when they go and face the Boston Celtics in the next round. And this is a team, again, it's a great series win without their starting center uh, to be able to handle this Orlando Young up-and-coming team. But I don't think they really figured anything out. I don't think the vibes are really good there this morning. I don't think there's confidence is very, very low going into this series against the Boston Celtics. So, mm. again, they do what they had to do to, to win against the Magic in seven games, which it's crazy it took them that long, honestly, against this team that's kind of on the rise. But... Yeah, I don't think this just heals the issues with Donovan Mitchell and that disconnect with that locker room and JB. It's kind of weird, Lou, that this this series is finally done. Um, it doesn't feel it just doesn't feel like anything. It doesn't feel like it started. It feels like eh, <laughs> I don't I don't know what to do with it, Lou. What are you doing with it? Um, it's I think you know moving forward, I think it's gonna be a, gonna be a good one. And I want to piggyback off what Chandler said about um about about Cleveland man I was looking at their body language my opinion was was the total opposite I was like damn he looks happy they look like they really accomplished something they got through it um they look like they they just felt good about what they had accomplished and what they had done together you know you're seeing the clips of Donovan Mitchell um hugging Garland and giving him the confidence talking about it post game and I was like you know that's something that you can build on that's something you can grow on that's positive energy that's good energy it looked like those guys are are happy to be playing together. They want to build together now. Coaching wise, you know, like I know Chandler in the NBA, coaches, uh, you know, whether they're good or bad, they can get switched out. But as far as the Cleveland Cavaliers go and the players, it looked like they were absolutely ecstatic to win that series and, and be teammates. So I, I feel like moving forward, they look like a confident group going into this series with the Boston Celtics. You know what's funny, Lewis? Okay, so they beat the Magic, right? They yeah. advanced in a series or so. Now, does anyone giving them a chance in hell to beat the Celtics? Zero. So why is no. it going to be so crazy when they lose this series and then they fire J.B. Bickerstaff? <laughs> like, there's no chance at all. Anyway, so if they beat this, are they going to give him a promotion and, and an extension? Uh, you have to. Like, like you, right? You have so to give him the team. He's going in there with no chance in the first place, so he's going to get know, fired just because they lose to the you Celtics? Know. Yeah, you know how the business works, though, brother. Winning cures all and winning to postpone a lot of bad plans. You know, I was I was part of one. You know, we won it with the Atlanta Hawks. 
We went to the Eastern Conference Finals. They were looking to move in a different direction coaching-wise, but we put a good run together, and we were able to stick it out with Coach Nate McMillan for another year um, before they released him after that. But before that, there were talks of him being moved before we made that run. So I see that situation similar with these Cleveland Cavaliers guys. Yeah. But look, like you said, nobody's giving them a shot to lose to, to beat the Boston Celtics. So even if they lose, don't blow the house up. It's not a fire. That's if what's they got funny. one win, it would feel like a big deal. Well, that's what's, maybe it's personal because I love JB, but they have a built-in fall guy already. Like, it's going to be JB Bickerstaff. So it, to me, it's like they know they don't have a chance in this series. And if they do manage to get it, then I'd love to see what they what oh they do with him. It's probably not going to happen, but it's just crazy going into the series. Even JB has to know this. Okay, we have no, we have a small chance, and soon as this soon as this ends in a sweep or a five or four one series, he's gone. And that, knowing that, preparing for this is pretty is, is a weird situation. And have to play these games against Boston. Yeah, like that sucks. By the way, they almost fired Pop. Remember? And then the team sort of rallied, and that and the rest is history. But I, I don't know. Thing, crazy things have happened. I, I don't know that it's going to happen in this one. Um, Shams, when you're watching this series, which, again, it went seven, did you, did you have any takeaways that maybe you didn't have going in? Donovan Mitchell, I mean, the way he performed the last two games, 89 points, that's the most in NBA history in back-to-back -back playoff games since Allen Iverson in 2001. Only those two guys, AI had 90 Donovan Mitchell had 89 the last two. So from a scoring perspective, clearly he had to lead this team. Uh, and a lot of what Chandler was speaking about, what Lou's talking about, a lot of it revolves around Donovan Mitchell. And you saw some of the bites from him after the game, the, the, ca the cameras, the mic caught him, kind of saying this is not what he came to Cleveland for, just to win one round, just to win in seven games. He had high aspirations when he got to the Cavs. Uh, they got him to contend for a championship. They truly believe internally Donovan Mitchell does at least, that this team can be a championship contender. And last season, the way they lost, this year it would have been just devastating if this franchise just lost to a lower seed in the first round. Yes, they win, an, it, win one series, but there's a lot of pressure on the Cavs to continue to win. And they're going to go up in, uh, against the Celtics as heavy underdogs. But they obviously, led by Donovan Mitchell, they have higher expectations. And that's a lot of the expectations Donovan Mitchell plays on himself and the team. And a lot of this goes with seeding. Now, if there was a different situation, if they happen to be a different seed and they're looking at facing the Knicks or the Pacers, then all of a sudden, at least there's some hope. There's yeah, some confidence. A bit. So this not only just falls on the coaching staff, this is these players that struggled all season long, that they were inconsistent, they were unhealthy, which again, that happens. The, but when they got hot for that one stretch in the season, they were really hot. They, Such a stretch. And, and they showed flashes. And I thought, you know, with the, everything they went through last year and last season, postseason against New York, there was higher expectations for this team. So I think with that comes also so a lot more pressure, and when they don't look good, they don't play good, they now have fallen into this seed where they, they just squeak by the Orlando Magic in a seven-game series and now have to go face arguably the best team in the NBA. It Ooh. just it doesn't feel good. It would be such a different story if they were playing against the Knicks or the Pacers, which they still probably wouldn't have a chance. Well, we get to use the whole offseason to figure out where Donovan Mitchell will ultimately end up. Um, Paolo Bancaro on the other side of this thing, though. Youngest player with 35 or more points in a game seven. So can he be the dude? Yes, he's a stud. He's an absolute stud. And as as much as Franz Wagner struggled, Jalen Suggs struggled. I mean, two for 13 and one for nine. You're not going to win a lot of games nice. when your two and three guys are doing that. But this guy, the maturity he's shown, the numbers he put up in this series was incredible. Um, just fearless. Can get to a spot. Strong, big body guard. Can post up. Can get out in transition. They, he showed that this is his team. And yeah, I think they do need to add a couple more pieces. They have money this summer. I'd love to go see them get a, a, a Brandon Ingram. I'd love them to get, uh, get a Paul George. I don't want them just to throw money at someone. But yeah, I think they are one to two pieces away. This this, this see franchise that, see is- that tweet right there? Yeah, what's that mean? Yeah. What's it mean, Lou? By the way, go I get Trey. Go get Trey Young. Go, Trey go, Young go. is rumored to go everywhere. Add talent. Add big names. The city is already. But listen, I'm from there, and this was this. They've been down the dumps for years. <laughs> At least now, there's some sort of excitement. There's a buzz, and a lot of it's around Paolo Bancaro. He's an absolute stud. Jamal Mosley is an absolute stud of a coach. They have something here. They have to go to Game Seven. Is, that's that's almost a win. Obviously, they want to win, but that that is great experience. That is a great season that they can look back and say, okay, with this young team, we did this. Now you add a couple more pieces when they have the flexibility of the summer. I think Orlando's going to be right there next year. Wait, Lou, are you saying Trey Young could go? No. Why would they? Why? I'm just I'm I'm just teasing. But you know what though? When we start talking about the future of the league and all of these young talented guys, we never mention Paolo for whatever reason. Him to for him to be in his second uh, second year is this yeah. his second first or second year? 
sad. It does. It does. Second year to take them seven games, have an opportunity to move on to the second round. Orlando Magic, they got some good bones. They got a good structure to start on. They got a franchise guy to move forward. You put some talent around them, like Chandler just said. The sky's the limit for these guys, and the league is in a great spot with so much young talent. And we got to start throwing his name in there. Much, much well deserved. Think about it. Number one pick last year, rookie of the year, all star this year. And now the, 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 I think the experience that he had on Team USA last summer, too, just really gave him the confidence going in that, okay, he was a role player on that. He was just trying to fit in. But now this Orlando Magic team, this is my team. We're going to build around me. And Franz Wagner, again, he's not, he even, Paolo said something incredible after what he said. Franz Wagner, he's our guy. He, he's going to be with He is an absolute stud. This one game is not going to define him. He's right. not going to, this is going to hurt. It's going to piss him off. Obviously, you don't want to go and go one for nine and have six points or whatever he had. But he had a great year and he's blown up. And people in Orlando, people in our league almost like him just as much as Palo. Now, I think Palo separated himself in the postseason, but this kid's a stud. Is he a bona fide number two option right now on a championship team? Probably not. But he has the capability to be that one two punch or a really good third option if Orlando can add something else. Yeah, it's, it just sucks that the last game of your season is. So that's, he's got to have that taste in his mouth the whole good. summer. But Not for good. a young for a young team to go in go into the the off season after a seven game uh, loss, that's good for you. If you're the GM and you're the coach of this team, you're excited because you know your guys are going into camp. They're going into their summer. They're motivated. They want to get better. They've seen success. They felt success. They've seen what a playoff atmosphere is like. They've seen the city rally around them. So now you got a lot of excitement coming into the season with a lot of young talent. And they've got things they can do. This is the best uh, season they've had since 2011, which seems like a thousand years ago, Shams. What, what do they plan on doing, if anything, during the offseason? The Magic can open up in excess of $60 million mm. in cap space Oof. this offseason. So they're going to be players. When you think about free agency and other moves that can be made, you look at scoring. Uh, in Game 7, obviously struggled a little bit to score the ball, especially in the second half of the game when the, the Cavs and Donovan Mitchell kept coming for them. So you look at the point guard position, but also uh, shooting and scoring on the wing. And one name to keep an eye on, Klay Thompson. I'm told there is mutual interest between the Magic and Klay Thompson. Oh. Thompson, along with several other vets around the league, are looking at the Magic as a situation where if you plug in a guy like Klay Thompson, you plug in another veteran player, whether it be at the point guard position, the shooting guard position, this team can make a real jump around Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner, both guys. Uh, Paolo Bancaro, already a star, already a guy that's been a part of Team USA. Franz Wagner has the ability to potentially be an all-star as well. But if you plug in some more sh shooting and scoring, I think that's what can take this Orlando team to another level. Here we go. Do you like that, the idea of Clay? The fact that there's mutual interest is interesting to me. I don't love it. I think they, they have the opportunity to kind of, you know, force Golden State's hand and pay him a lot more money than Golden State's trying to do. And I do think Shams hit it on the nose. They do need shooting. They need to they need players to space the floor to let Franz Wagner, to let, you know, Paolo go to work. But I'd rather them see them go get another a Brandon Ingram. I'd rather see them go get a Paul George, kind of a go-to mm. guy that almost on most nights. I don't know if Clay Thompson could be the number one guy on a lot of nights anymore. Paul well, George can still do that. Brandon Ingram, I can see them throwing something. a little bag at D'Angelo Russell, an off-scoring guard. I can see them. The Trey Young thing kind of makes sense. So I think they're, they're in a situation where they can get hmm. better in a lot of ways, whether that's via trade or free agency. With $60 million, the, the options are endless. That's a lot of money. When it comes to those small guards, though, I wonder what, what, what does that do for Suggs, a guy like Cole Anthony that is still trying to find that way. Even Markel Fultz, as much as that he's been through in his career, he's finally figured it out. He's found a home somewhere that loves him, somewhere he can play confident and give him good minutes, even though these guys didn't play great um, in this playoff series. But you can tell that Orlando was building that way. So that's my only concern when it comes to, you know, these small guards of Trey Youngs and the D'Angelo Russells, if you add them to that group. Suggs, too. Suggs has put me on a roller coaster. When he came out, I thought he was going to be really good. Then I was like, wow, this guy's going to be in Europe. I feel like that about Cole Anthony. Yeah, and now I'm like, you know what? Wow, this kid's good again. He's, he's, he really expanded his game, shooting a high percent from the three this year. He's always been a great athletic defender. So he's another player that kind of was almost on the fence in my on the fringe of being an NBA player, and now he's a bona fide player in this league. Who just had a bad last game as Who well. also like had a shitty last game. Crap way to end the season. Um, we had a game one. Oh, did we ever? Well, well, well. Minnesota Timberwolves go into Denver and grab a victory. Anthony Edwards 
Goodness gracious. Uh, a franchise playoff record of 43 points. He's the second player with back-to-back 40 or more point games. At the age of 22 or younger, Obs, Kobe is the other. Nas Reed, 14 of 16 of his points came in the fourth quarter. Jokic did have 32-8, nine assists, seven turnovers, but we have to talk Anthony Edwards. At 22 years old, Chandler, who has been more impressive than him? I don't, I don't have the words for this kid. It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable, and I say it all the time, every time I talk about this team. He does it on both ends of the floor. It's ridiculous, the effort. Usually a kid that's 22 years old, a star offensive player with that much talent and that much game that he has, that's what he's focused on, that's right. what he does. A Luka Doncic, a Trey Young, these guys that come in, they're big scorers early. They don't care about defense. This kid does. He's active. He wants to guard the other team's best player. And then when you just look at his handles, the, his his package on the offensive end is absolutely insane. He was huge down the stretch for them. Uh, he, he, it's, it's off the block post up and transition. He's smart. He's picking and choosing when to go, when to be aggressive, when to get his other teammates involved. And this was unbelievable. This was probably the most impressive win to me of all the playoffs so far, just yeah. because no one, I didn't expect this, Denver is this juggernaut, Denver, how do you do it? And this team goes in and gets a road a road win in game one. That's game impressive. One. And a lot of it had to do with Anthony Edwards, and it's just unbelievable he can go and drop 43 points <laughs> in Denver. Uh, it was special. It was a special, special performance. It's kind of ridiculous, Lou. I think we've been getting this all wrong, man. We're looking at the face of the league. Mm. We've been trying to figure it out. We've been throwing all of these different names around. It's Anthony Edwards. The way that he played against Denver in that game one, he put the world on notice. He's one of the... I, listen, I haven't felt like this since Derrick Rose when it comes to, like, a young guy coming out and making an impact this fast. Like, we didn't understand. We didn't think that the Minnesota Timberwolves would be this competitive this fast. And we also didn't think Anthony Edwards would be playing at the level that he's playing as, as fast either. So to, to have both of those things happening at the same time is an exciting time to be a, a basketball fan. But I, I'm I'm probably in a minority. I feel like they can sneak another game here in Denver how they played the first game. Mm. How about him, 22 years old, too, going up against his like mentor, yeah. KCP, role model, big reason he went to Georgia, and he said, listen, that's my big brother. I'm trying to rip his fucking head off. That's the like, thing. Like, that's he's a, the he, guy. He's a killer, man. It is unbelievable. We've been saying, we've been looking for that MJ Kobe assassin mentality. We got him. And he's right in front of us right now. Uh, Shams, that, look, I, we figured the series would be good. Uh, but to go in and get a game one victory is on a whole nother level. What would you see? I mean, obviously, Anthony Edwards being that guy, the, the face of the potential of, of the league, potentially. And what I love about him is he's he's relentless. Like, he's going for everything. <laughs> he doesn't want to stop short of his goals. Like, a, a few months ago or a couple months ago, we talked about Anthony Edwards being on team. He was saying, like, he didn't just want to be on the team. He wants to go and start. He wants to compete with Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Jason Tatum's, all these guys that have led this league and have been considered to be among the face of the league. He's coming for all of them. He wants to be that guy. And when I watch this series, I can't help but also think, this is really the Tim Connolly Bowl. He went and built the Nuggets. He drafted Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr., hired Michael Malone. That was literally his team. Traded for Aaron Gordon, which made that team a true contender. And then now in Minnesota, he goes and trades for Rudy Gobert, Mike Conley, and he's really changed that entire culture. And he's built that Minnesota team exactly the way that, that you need to to beat Denver. Like, he legitimately went in and, and, and built that entire organization and figured out how do we beat the Denver Nuggets. I know this is the team to beat over the next several years, and I think he might have just done it. And, he, and we talked about it a, a while ago. He does have an opt-out in his contract. That's something that does hover around Anthony Edwards and Minnesota. Their president has an opt-out, and Detroit is really targeting Tim Connolly as well as John Horst in Milwaukee. But right now, Tim Connolly obviously has to be completely locked into this Anthony Edwards If show. he turns that franchise around, he'll get a statue. He's a deity at that point. Like, yeah, yeah right? Has there been it's a front office guy, Sean, with a statue? Because <laughs> oh. Tim Connolly <laughs> might get it. That would be <laughs> incredible. <laughs> it's coming. It is coming. Look, we all, I think most people, including all of the books, have the Nuggets going back to the finals and repeating. Um, and then you get a win like this for Minnesota, which is like, it's a moment. It's a head scratcher. Like, okay, does it do anything for you as far as the longevity of this series? 
Well, yeah, Netflix. because now I think this is almost like the Boston Celtics Miami Heat series where they got punched in the mouth game two and they, it almost humbled them. Like, okay, we are beatable. We're, we're human. <laughs> and we can't just go through the motions against this Minnesota team. This is a team that defense travels. They've been the number one defense all year long. And with their length and their activity and the different looks they can give you, they present a lot of challenges, even to the Denver Nuggets, who are very, very, very good offensively. And they're not going to panic. Without Nas Reed going absolutely berserk in the fourth quarter here <laughs> and making a big play after big play, Mike Conley hitting a big three, Anthony Edwards doing what he did in those highlights. There was a collective effort, but the Nuggets were still right there with how well that the Minnesota Timberwolves played. It could have easily went the other way, especially Nas Reed. He got extremely hot. So I don't think there's any reason to panic, but I think, yeah, now they know, okay, this team is for real. This team isn't just like this surprise team with one good player. This is this this team is loaded. This team defends. They gave Jokic a lot of different looks where seven turnovers, he can't do that. No. He cannot, he, he's got to be careful with the ball. He's got to get other guys. Where are these other guys? Uh, Porter had a good game, but besides that, no one at KCP, nothing. Jamal Murray, he's been struggling. We talked about Jamal Murray's game winners, yes, but outside of that, he's been shooting the ball very, very poorly all postseason. So I think there's definitely things the Nuggets can clean up, but this game, this series might go seven. It is, it I'm is, fine with that. Yeah, I hope it does. Chandler, shit just got real. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I say that because the Timberwolves have all the ingredients to be a problem for Denver, bro. They got size. They have superstar talent. They have wing defenders. They have a six man. They got veteran leadership. And they're fearless. They're not scared of Denver. They're there for the challenge. And like you said, the most important part, they have guys who want to sit down and play defense. They take pride in it. And when your superstar player is at the head of that and he wants to be the guy to take on Jamal Murray or whoever else is going to be hot on the Denver team, to be able to take them out of games and give you 43 on the other end, it's going to be a long series for the Denver Nuggets, bro. It is true because McDaniels can guard anybody. He's going to give Murray problems. And I love when they put Towns or Nas Reed on Jokic and let Rudy float because he really gave him trouble. Jokic is really good getting that ball right in the paint and throwing that 4-5 lob to Aaron Gordon. And a lot of times, Rudy Gobert was kind of playing that you know help side defense where he was deflecting, he was knocking away. You can't guard Jokic one-on-one. -on -one. He's going to have his way. Carl Anthony Towns also has to stay out of foul trouble. Right, this guy does one. this every game. Yep. He's got to do that because he's too valuable on the offensive end. But Lou's right, man. This team, it's the way that they're set up. They are just a, they're, they're a bad matchup for Denver. So Denver's going to really have to make some adjustments. Yeah, the seedings in this one, it's almost like it was meant to be this way. Yeah, Jokic did have his 32, but the 11 of 25 shooting and those seven turnovers are big as well. Uh, here he is after the game talking about that Minnesota defense. To have a duplicate clone of myself <laughs> and then I can, you know, I can be uh, uh, fresh when they sub another guy, I, I'm going to be fresh. Seems like a good strategy to have for the rest of the series. Imagine like being his teammate and hearing that. Well, he know for I himself. Like I don't like it. I don't like it. It just sounds like the confidence is wavering a little it bit. Did. Not a lot, it's, but it just uh, sounds yeah. like he's, he's concerned. It sounds he's like concerned. he's trying to be cool, but he's really insecure at the same time, and it doesn't, I didn't yeah. love it. That makes him vulnerable. He's concerned. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever heard him make a statement like that. He's, he's concerned about the matchup problems that the Minnesota Timberwolves are, are, are creating for him. He's just tired is all. No, he wasn't saying he's going to have five of him out there. No, I know. I know. Like, I that know. would be rude. Yeah, that would not be nice. <laughs> that would not go very well. Um, yeah, like, is, is will they figure something out? By game yeah, two? again, I think he him taking 25 shots, I love that he's going to be aggressive, but he's got to take care of the ball more. The possessions are valuable, especially when the offense slows down in the playoffs, and we've seen that. There hasn't really been these 140, 150-point games. Everything is slower now. Everything is possession by possession. So, yeah, there's going to have to be guys like Justin Holliday knocking down shots. Peyton Watson's got to be valuable. Christian Brown, Reggie Jackson, these other guys that were very, very productive in this first game, they got to get more. We, For the most part, we know what we're getting from Jokic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know what we're getting from Jamal Murray, although he's kind of been up and down with his shooting woes. But Michael Porter has honestly been their second Fantastic. best player. Like he's been unbelievable how consistent he's been. So they got to keep him going. But again, Minnesota puts them in a box with it with their matchups. And when you look at across the board, one through five, Minnesota kind of matches up perfectly oh, with man. them. So and, and they're gonna have to sit down and guard them. And on the flip side, they don't have anybody to guard Carl Anthony Towns. They don't have anybody to guard Anthony Edwards. And then with these other guys, with Mike Conley's and Jaden McDaniels and they're hitting shots, this team is dangerous. There's a reason why that their record was what the, what it was this year. Uh, Jamal Murray, as you mentioned, he's had some 
huge moments. But he shot 40% from the field, 32% from three. The good news, though, is I think he's due for a game winner in game two. If we're going <laughs> yeah. by any sort of pattern. How do you get him to sort of be a little more consistent? Well, again, I think he's got to pick his spots. He's got to be more efficient. He can't just be settling for these long step back shots. It reminds me of Tatum sometimes in, in, in where he, he almost is forcing, shooting 31% from the field Eesh. is, is, is no, 40 from the field, yeah, 31 three. from three. That, that's not him. I feel like he's one of these players that we've almost put in this underrated, never been an all-star, but he's clutch and he's been great down the stretch. Very. But again, when you're dealing with their length and you're dealing with guys like Anthony Edwards, they're so much bigger and athletic and Jaden McDaniel's length. And then when you do get by him, you have the defensive player of the year in the paint. He's, he's just got to make better decisions. He's got to get easier looks. I'd love to see him get to the free throw line, get a couple early ones, get out in transition, force some, force some turnovers and get easy buckets. Because when he gets going and he's hot in the first quarter, he always has a big game. This game, I've never seen him have such a slow start. This bizarre. first half, it was, it was it was bizarre. A lot of that has to do with the uh, you know the Timberwolves defense, but he's just got to he's got to stay aggressive, but he's got to make sure that he's getting good looks. Yeah, what do you tell him, Lou? I mean, we know he's not afraid to shoot. Like when he's had slumps, we've seen him continue to do it, and then a game winner. So what do you tell him if you're your teammate? Yeah, he just got to continue to be aggressive, be himself, and just be assertive. But you know, it's tough. Jamal Murray kind of likes to play a comfortable basketball game. You know, he wants to come down, <laughs> handle, come off of pick and rolls and shoot, play in the mid range, some back doors every now and then. Minnesota Timberwolves are disruptive. They're picking you up full court. They're trapping, they're talking. And, and like Chandler said, once you get past all of that pressure from their elite guards and how they defend, you got to deal with the defensive player of the year when you get into the hole. And that's going to that's gonna be problematic for Jamal Murray, especially with a strained calf, not being able to play comfortably, not being able to just do the things you want to do, having a team speeding you up, and you're not 100%, that's going to be an uphill battle for him in this series. Chandler has something to say. I got the Nuggets tonight. He's, okay, I, so he's I, they're, they're balancing good. it out. I like the money line. So I like them five thing. and a half. I think they make adjustments. I think they're going to – I think it's – it's. can you imagine them down 2 -0? I just can't. I, that's the thing. I, is, I, think, I, 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 I actually – I can't imagine them down 2 -0. There's no way it's But Lou happen. said something before. He's like, he sees a world in which they, they could potentially go in. I don't know, man. Yeah, that was, that listen, was a convincing win. The popular opinion would be to think that Denver's not going to lose two in a row on their home court to right. start the, the series. But again – if we're going to talk about the Minnesota Timberwolves for 10 straight minutes, mm -hmm. I'm on the edge of my seat waiting for this game tonight because I think it's going to be that much exciting. It's going to be that exciting with all of the star power and everything that the Timberwolves are doing right now. I see a world in where they could go up 2-0 going home. I we're getting guess. very far ahead here, but what if what if the Timberwolves sweep the Nuggets? They what, might. Like, what, they what, could. What, what if that, Anything what, can. What, <laughs> then are we talking about shopping Jamal Murray and Aaron? Like, Tear it apart. The whole about. narrative on this juggernaut just not switches. Even, let's not even open that Pandora box. Oh, oh my God. Okay, you know what? But if we get a, if there's a, a Minnesota win tonight, Oh, then we're going. we are then opening we're up that box Phoenix. tomorrow, Lou. T-Wolves in four. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's, that's what's we're happening. bringing that kid to Minnesota. T-Wolves in oh, four, guys. Oh, God. Uh, we do have some scoops. Things were happening. Things are always happening. Shams, Darvin Ham. I mean, yeah, writing on the wall. Uh, the search for the next coach looks like what? Extensive coaching search beginning most likely this week. The top candidates, Mike Budenholzer, former championship head coach of the Bucks, Kenny Atkinson, J.J. Redick, Charles Lee, and Ty Lue is really the big name if he's available. Obviously, the Clippers want to keep him, want to extend him. He has one year left on his deal with the Clippers. But whoever the Lakers hire for this job, the task will be competing for a championship. Not the playoffs, not the conference finals, but a championship around LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And this is one of the most high-powered jobs in the league. A lot of expectations will be on whoever that next head coach is. And really, a lot of the things that the Lakers felt Darvin Ham just did not do at the highest of levels, rotations, adjustments, game plans, I think they're going to look for someone that can really command that locker room. So those are the names. The process begins likely this week. <laughs> the process has begun again. Who, I don't know who would want that job. Like, I, I mean, if you're Bud or you're Atkinson, you're a coach that's already tried it and been fired, maybe right. you go back there. If I'm J.J. Redick, I'd be terrified of the job. If I'm, this is what I'm going to do and this is what I'm going to get into and this is my first opportunity, if that But he's your work, podcast buddy. Yeah, but if that doesn't work, this could be the shortest coaching stint in the history of the NBA. Like, it's just... It's why a, have it's, a coach? Yeah, why not I, just let I, LeBron coach? Like, why have a person stand there? Wait till JB gets for, fired and hire bigger staff. Like, it's just, it seems like a, a formality that you're expected to have a bunch of dudes on the bench be coaches. But at the end of the day, we, have you seen that podcast at all and you see them break down plays and call plays out of timeout and all that stuff? Just let him coach. I, I don't have a doubt. And I'm not even trying to be sarcastic. I don't have a doubt in my mind he couldn't do it. <clears throat> Well, yeah, no. especially if JJ is just—he's Lou shaking his board. head. Lou, Lou, Lou what's wrong with head. my plan? Who do you hire, Lou? <laughs> 
no, ch- it's no chance that J.J. Reddick is going to be able to command that locker room. Yeah, him and LeBron can sit there and drink wine together and break down plays, <laughs> but it's a little different when you got 20,000 people screaming at you and you got 11 other players that you got to manage as well. And so I'm not saying that J.J. isn't fit for the job. We simply haven't seen him be fit for the job, right? So there's only one person that I could see managing this, and I hate to say it, it's going to be Ty Lue. What? And, all, and, and the only reason I say Ty Lue for this job is because he speaks the language. He knows how to communicate with players. He's obviously a proven uh, championship coach, and he's been there already with LeBron. He's already ex- had that experience. He's already already shared a locker room with him and been able to manage it and win a championship with him. Out of all the names on that list, I think that's the only but name that I see. Is also, that an upward move for Ty Lu? No, it's, it wor- it's like a worse it's situation. Not. I mean, it's a convenient move. You don't really have to, you don't have sure. to do anything. But no, I'm riding with the Clippers. Why would Ty Lu have any interest? Jason Kidd, why would he have any interest leaving what he's got going on in Dallas yeah. for this? No no chance. This is a tough, as cool as it is and as glamorous as it is in L.A. and the Lakers. And, it's a shitty job. It is it's, a, like, it's a job with an expiration It date. is a job where, Which, yeah, oh. it is. You're just, you are on the clock, tick-tock, tick-tock, and you are fired eventually when something doesn't go your way and LeBron's not rolling with you anymore. So Which that, can happen before the All-Star break. And also, I wonder, like, you know, let's say you, t- let's say you get one of these vet dudes to take the gig, right? When they get fired, is it expected that other teams in the hiring process for new coaches will always take into context? Like, if you went and coached the Lakers with LeBron on it, when you go back out into the to the no, like is employment, Darvin, is Darvin Ham going to get a, another job this summer? Like, it's, no, it's a career no. killer. Like, it's it's a it's a bad, like it's it. a it's a tough spot. I don't think Darvin Ham gets another look to be a head coaching this summer. Like, it's <laughs> that muse, you're awesome. So good. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like that. Yeah, it's it's fun. It sounds cool. Your head coach. It's, all, Lakers, it's awesome. Yeah. That they're, they're, like you said, there's an expiration date on that, and that is tough. I don't like it. I don't like it. It's not the only coaching news, though. You mentioned someone, Chandler Shams. We got some more coaching news with Jason Kidd. Multi-year contract extension for Jason Kidd. You think about his three seasons in Dallas, two postseason appearances, the Western Conference Finals this season, uh, Western Conference Semifinals appearance. I'm told Nico Harrison, their general manager, he's going to be in line for an extension as well. So they're going to be locking their GM, their head coach, and you have to give credit to, to both of them. Nico Harrison went out and got Kyrie Irving last year at the trade deadline, got P.J. Washington, Daniel Gafford this year at the trade deadline. They, they built, Chandler's been, been saying it for months, they've built the deepest team around Luka Doncic that he's ever had in Dallas. It's a credit to both of them for finding the right talent, but also being able to have the relationships with a Kyrie Irving, with Daniel Gafford. P.J. Washington has spoken publicly about the fact that he knew Nico Harrison when he was on the AAU circuit. So they've been able to navigate, find the right guys, and now Jason Kidd and Nico Harrison rewarded with contract extensions. Yeah, and it was not too long ago when we are talking about this trade last year. It's not going to work, these oh, guys too. Sure. So just getting Kyrie and Luka to be able to coexist alone deserves an extension. And the fact that they did add these pieces and Shams hit it and Nico, he's great. He's a cool dude. He's been in the Nike and the shoe grassroots business for a while. So most players have had a previous relationship with Nico, which I think helps because there's just that trust. There's that bond that you have with this guy who now is in charge of your team and your career. So when you have a, a history like that, it helps. And then Jay Kidd, obviously, he's a historic player. He's a legendary Hall of Fame player that Luca respects, that Kyrie right. Irving respects. So when those two top guys respect you, and then they add the pieces, the P.J. Washington, the Daniel Gafford, they get the Josh Greens. Of the, they, that, now they all of a sudden have a real complete team that I knew they were going to smack, lose Clippers. I know. And now here we are. I'm actually proud of you for waiting till now <laughs> to even make any kind of reference to that. You got Lou? my Venmo, Lou. I still haven't got a little, I haven't got a cha-ching <laughs> my Venmo. Listen, it's, it's, it's deserved. You earned it, bro. You caught it. I, I, the Dallas Mavericks, they played a much better series than the Clippers. They look more hungry. And we talked about it all year. The Clippers are one of those teams. They have to be 100% healthy for them to be able to compete at this level. And and, and obviously with Kawhi out, that was, that was a major stinger for them, and it didn't go their way. So well, you were right. I owe you hold some that cheese. thought, because when we come back, we are going to talk some more Clippers. And what do they do next? Quick break here when we come back. This is Run It Back. It's our first commercial. Run it back, yeah. run it over, run it back, yeah, yeah, run it over. More of uh, the Clippers, of course. And, yeah, it was six games in that one. They had Kawhi only for two. Paul George, James Harden struggled over the last two games. And Russ, you know, I don't know what to say about Russ. Um, the Clippers have only won three series in five seasons together 
since PG and Kawhi teamed up. This is um, this is obviously, especially now we're here in Los Angeles, Shams, going to be front and center. They got the new building. We know all about it. What do we think this Clippers team is looking to do next? The, this Clippers team fully intends to keep this group together. They want to bring back Paul George as a free agent or give him, him an extension, but they have not been able to reach an agreement with Paul George. They've made multiple contract offers below the max contract. They have not been able to reach a deal, so they're going to keep trying. We'll see if he tests free agency. Ty Lue's the other big one. He's got one year left on his deal, but they have not discussed an extension with him the entire season, and now their focus will be, can we get an extension done with Ty Lue? Uh, obviously, he's emerged as one of the best coaches in the NBA. For them, though, I feel like everything still hovers around health. Like for another year, Kawhi Leonard, three years ago in 2021, it's a torn ACL. 2023, torn meniscus. This year, the knee inflammation because of the ACL and the meniscus in the years prior. They just have not been able to field a fully healthy team. And then uh, in front of all that, you have the James Harden for agency as well. So they want to keep all these guys. We'll see if they'll be able to do so. Hmm. The problem is these guys are they're they're not getting healthier. They're not getting or younger. younger. Yeah. So it's, it's it's this is this is who they are. It's and tough. again, I think when they're healthy, they are a very good basketball team. It's just in Kawhi Leonard, we were, me and Michelle were just talking about the break. It just sucks because he was so good. All year. <laughs> we were talking about wow, he's back. He's Toronto. He's San Antonio Kawhi. He's healthy. He's strong. And then come the playoff time, it's almost like Joel Embiid. It's like you have to factor in him missing time. And the shitty part for the Clippers is they're built to win right now. Right. And they're not winning right now. So it's like what, you're not going to just blow it up because you still feel like next season, if we're healthy, we have enough to win. They have a great coach that they should extend. They have three players, four players. They're one of the deepest teams in the NBA. So I, I think they're not in like a panic mode dumpster fire where they just need to they, they freak out and, and move everybody. I think they need to make a priority to sign Paul George. I think that's critical to their to their future. And again, they they don't really have these young assets like mm -hmm. San Antonio. Like you know, what I mean, they are built for right now. So try and maximize these three guys, and figure out what, how we can get these guys healthy, which is going to continue every year to get harder and harder. Yeah, Lou. I mean, this, this is uh this is the team you backed in this bet with uh, Chandler, and and you know, I keep seeing people say just run it back, do it again. But does that feel right to you? Do you, do you just do the same thing all over again? It's twofold for me. Like, I, I think making sure Paul George is back is a business decision. This reminds me of the Brooklyn Nets when they first went to Brooklyn, when they had Paul uh, Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Darren Williams in that group. You got to have a lot of star power moving into your new building. You want to put ass in those seats, especially with all the innovative stuff that Steve Ballmer wants to do. You got to have a draw. You got to have guys that are going to get the fan base excited, put together a great season. And I think Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, they give you an opportunity to, opportunity to do that at the forefront of what you're trying to build. So if I'm Steve Ballmer, I got to run this thing back at least one more time. Yeah, this isn't the time to blow it up. Going in a new arena for energy, <laughs> like you can't just blow this up. You have to have at least the names, and maybe they don't win next year, but you have okay. to have a good product going into this building, and they do, they do. Does that include Russell Westbrook? I, I think they're going to have that option. I think he's been so valuable for them all year long, and now with his struggles in the postseason and not playing a lot of minutes in this series and kind of having the up and downs. I, I, and again, he's a year older, so this, this isn't a guy that's going to continue to get better. He is what he yeah. is, and I think his minutes are going to continue to go down. But yeah, I think Russ is still valuable. I still think he can be that spark plug off the bench. We were talking about him being six man of the year, Paul. Like, like <laughs> he, he's still he's still a really really talented, valuable basketball player. So yeah, I'd love to see him return back. These guys are all LA guys go into this new arena fresh and excited um, and try and stay healthy, which is obviously hard to do. I know, such a feel-good story having all four guys be back in L.A. Everyone seemed like they were happy. <sighs> Should be interesting. Um, the best series of the first round ended in six games as well. Knicks taking care of the Sixers uh, on Philly's home floor. Embiid in this thing averaged 33 and 11, but he shot only 44%, hammered by Bell's palsy and a lingering knee injury. Like, who can even make that up at this point? Tyrese Maxey added 30 points a game, but that did did not help because no one else did much. Uh, Shams, future plans for Philly. What are we looking at? This is exactly why they made the James Harden trade when they did. It's about building around Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey. They've got three first-round draft picks to play with this summer. They've got max salary space as well. So they're going to go big game hunting. They're going to be rumored with every top free agent, every top player that's available in free agency or in trade market. They want to see how they can add one more star player around Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey, that puts obviously the future of Tobias Harrison question, hmm. where does he end up as a free agent?
I'll give you a scoop, Shams. He ain't, Tobias Harris ain't going back to Philly. He's really not. Tobias Harris. <laughs> no, he was getting the Julius <laughs> Randle yeah, treatment. Yeah, I'm glad you said it. It was you not can good. just tell, well, and I know nothing. I swear I don't have a tip. I don't have that man will well, I, never I play for the 76ers again. There's no chance in hell. He is maxed out. The the, the crowd is off of him. The, the franchise done. off him. You can just see this shit has come to a screeching halt. He will Ouch. not be on the Sixers next. It was year. such a big yeah. deal when he got it too. Like. What a feel-good yeah, moment for him. And then you see Detroit is the is the favorite to side him. I'm like, all right, what about Jesus? You hate to see it, but listen, on a on the flip side, Chandler, you know you know what sounds good to me? Brandon Ingram. This is a this would be a great landing spot for Brandon and Brandon Ingram. You already have your guard and Tyrese Maxey. You got a big in Joel MB. Now you got to tie up that hole that Tobias Harris leaving is 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 gonna be there. So you got to fill that void. And I think Brandon Ingram would be the perfect guy for that. And yeah, I agree. I think he'd be great. I think Paul George would be great. I think there's some there's reports that Jimmy Butler. I don't think he's already there. That didn't really pan out. Don't really yes. see that happening. Yeah. But I don't hate those. And again, Ubre was great. With the rise of Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid. People are gonna talk about his injuries just like Kawhi Leonard because he's he hasn't been fully healthy when it matters. But Let's not forget, this dude was well on his way to back-to-back -to -back MVPs, yeah. was the most dominant player in the league. He this guy pretty much dominated the Knicks all series long, limping, like not even close to being 100%. So I think they're in a good spot. And they're like, like Lou said, they're one wing score away from being right back in the hunt in the Eastern Conference next year. Okay, so but let's be realistic, all right? So we know Joel Embiid, despite being injured, was out there giving it his all. But the injuries are pretty big, and they happen all the time. So, Lou, do you actually see, when you close your eyes, do you see this Sixers team winning a championship with Joel Embiid? I think so. I think if you put the right pieces around them, they have an opportunity. Like, like Chandler said, this man was dominating this series with one eye, one <laughs> half a face, <laughs> one knee. Half a face. And... And he, yeah, and he was still out there putting up big numbers, putting him in a position to give him everything he had, even when he was um, inefficient shooting the basketball. He was still making winning plays on a defensive end and trying to do everything necessary. You don't stumble on Joel Embiid type talent in the NBA and just say, okay, we can pick up and keep moving here um, with somebody else. He's one of those, he's a cornerstone type of guy. So even though he's unhealthy, who else do you go get to fill that void? I think you stay put with Joel Embiid, Continue to build around him and Maxi, and then put a lot of a lot of talent around those guys where he doesn't have to do as much heavy lifting. He doesn't. You don't have to be carried through 50 to 60 games throughout a season. I think they still can, they still have an opportunity, and there's a window there for them to compete for a championship. Yeah. <clears throat> Lou, they can't do like a Joel lateral move. If you're gonna fully blow it up and rebuild and get a bunch of picks for this cat, yeah. But we know damn well that's not Daryl Morey's MO either. That's true, too. And Shams, you know this. Daryl Morey, if there's someone available or if there's a way to upgrade the roster or go get a big free agent, it's going to be Daryl Morey's going to be on that phone making that call hey, to make their team better. They can't better. start a new process, Chandler. No, they're, no, no. They're We've all been trusting this process. process has yeah, been pre Ben now. Simmons. There's yeah. The process is here. Process is forever. Joel Embiid ain't going anywhere. Start a new process. We got to go. Add around Joel Embiid and keep him out. Like you said, go get a stud wing that can take off some of the load of Joel Embiid and let Tyrese Maxey be the guy. And when it matters, Joel Embiid is fully healthy in the playoffs, dominating like he did in the beginning of the season. Kind of like a Miami Heat situation where you had Shaq and D-Wade. Obviously, Shaq was the dominant. He was going to be the guy that was going to anchor. But D-Wade is going to be the best player on that team. He was the one that led them to that championship hmm. run. Philadelphia can piggyback off of that success. Mm -hmm. And just know, if there's someone available, Daryl Morey will He's be calling. It. The process continues, Shams. I can't wait. Um, Shams, we'll see you bright and early in the morning. We'll take a quick break. Come back. The process. Run it up. The running back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it That man has a family. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Where this one counts because Brook Lopez is out. Mm. Obi Cobb is in. We can have one last moment with I Brooke. saw Robin Lopez at the Kentucky Derby. Congratulations. But not Brooke. Oh, well, maybe he's... Brooke was somewhere sunny yeah. and had a family. He's got to do stuff. Um, <laughs> did you say hi to Robin? No. Robin doesn't strike me as a Kentucky Derby guy. I did not say hi. <laughs> I saw him run a distance. You're the worst. I did. Uh, Kelly Oubre with the block. Kelly, ew. Ew. No. Yeah. Oubre. Oubre. There's he had a hell of a he had a hell of a, honestly he his did. series exposed Tobias even more because he was even more valuable and he would play defense. Get off Tobias, Are we going to talk about Ubre's weird history no, with I like love. crashing the Lamborghini and the all that? He had a weird year yeah, off the, the whole court. Yeah, the the bike accident that really slid under the radar. Just went away, didn't it? Uh, no worries, OG.
just like that. This is now. Redemption. Oh my. <laughs> Again, I mean, well, yeah, it's a foul too. He put, this is a little dangerous too. Joel had some risky plays here in this series. Did you see the thing with Joel with the security? And he did some kind of crap stuff. He lost a lot of fans that maybe didn't have an issue with Joel. I, I saw that. I didn't, I, I didn't like that. I didn't like that either. Maybe we'll do an hour that. on it tomorrow. Playoffs. We'll do an hour Listen, tomorrow. It gets, Oof. It's a funny thing in the playoffs when these type of things happen. But anyway. Yeah, it's weird. Oh. Um, oh. Mm. The finish is tougher than the than the move. That is fine. I just like I watched that when it was happening. I was like, that was something Are these else. like farewell clips? Nobody. Kind of. I mean, OG's still alive, but everybody else. Actually, our next one, too, still alive. Uh, good, yeah, for good vertical there, Georgie. Oh. Hey. Oh, oh Zucci, man. Oh, uh, Zucci, man. <laughs> That's so stupid. Gafford, what a blow-up. That's up. a mano y mano dunk. Does it just show oh, you man. opportunity, though? It's crazy. Like, him, he's in Washington. We never talk about him. Now he's with Luca. He's in Dallas. He's on TV, and he's yeah. turning into a household name. Yeah, it's weird how that works. It's awesome. Exposure. Yeah. <laughs> we get to see oh, things. Oh, look at him do it on both ends. This is dumb. I'm ready to see, I'm ready to see more tonight. I can't wait. I can't wait either. Can't wait. This game is I'm going to need a nap, Lou. This, I'm going to need a Lou nap. This possibly is the worst foul call ever. They called a foul on Jamal Murray right there. Yeah, I didn't make sense. I, I know. Wait. <laughs> To go to sleep. Watch this foul call on Jamal Murray, Lou. We got two good games tonight, actually. I'm excited. Douche. And you know what, Lou? You're on that East Coast time again. Did so. You say douche. Well, I meant it differently. Um, <laughs> Where's the foul? Where's the foul? Here we go. We always get to the end of the show and get a little loopy. Here we go. <laughs> we well, stop talking about the foul. It's already. Stop talking about douche. I'm not calling it a douche. <laughs> We're taking a quick break. We'll be back. Jesus. <laughs> like douche. <laughs> Well, the NBA playoffs are definitely here. Not too late to get in on the action with FanDuel because right now new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Use your bets on same-game parlays, live bets, championship futures, and so much more. There is no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Just download the app to get started. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Game of the night, Pacers, Knicks, game one. It begins. Chandler, who you got? I got the New York Knickerbockers. I think the they're, the, first of all, the guard's got to be rocking. So dumb. I cannot wait for both of these games. I put my daughter to sleep last night, so I didn't, have to, do it, so I didn't have to do it tonight. Word that I am, differently. Because I am tired. <laughs> what is with you today? <laughs> it's Monday. Because I am watching both these games. I love the Knicks. I love the Knicks money line. I love the Knicks with the points. This game starts at 4. You're putting her to bed at 4? Well, no, I'm just, I told Haley, I said, on both games, I'm That's working. Amazing. Said, babe, I'm working tonight. <laughs> Not now. Not now. I like the Knicks. All right, Knicks. Lou? Oh, no. I think I can. I think I, think I can hear what he, he took the Knicks. He took the Knicks too. Yeah. Okay, yeah, he took the Knicks as well. Yeah. Well, that's just gonna jinx it all, don't you? Oh my bad. I got, oh, my there bad. he is. My oh, dog stopped barking. Did yeah, you take the dog, Knicks? My dog stopped barking, so I hit I hit mute. <laughs> but I, I said I, I like the Indiana Pacers just oh, to piss me off. So I'm going Pacers. Piss me off. The city Brunson. of eight million. You're pissing Jaylen off. Jalen Brunson revenge <laughs> against <laughs> his <laughs> old coach Rick Carlisle. Brunson forty plus tonight, game one. No, I, I like the Knicks. I like the Knicks. Oh wait, are we talking for the series or for tonight? Tonight series, I okay. think. Tonight series. Oh, everything. Yeah. When the game slows down in this series, it majorly favors the New York Knicks. They I, get this up and down. They don't want to get up and down with the Pacers. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, that garden tonight is going to be insane. And Jason Bateman will definitely be there because he's been at every game. Both you have the Knicks. 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 Of course I do. That's going to do it for us. We'll be back in the morning. Enjoy. Run it up, run it back. Run it up, run it back. Run it up, run it back. Run it up, run it back.